it was 25 years ago and that was when i published my first systematic review paper i understand there is also a question about what type of research should we get involved in and i'd like to highlight that for students to become involved in studies that require ethical approval consent from patients long duration for follow-up um, all of this is time consuming and maybe not practically feasible while you are still also studying for exams uh, but systematic reviews or meta-analysis offers an excellent alternative because it does not require collection of data from patients it does not require obtaining consent from patients it does not require ethical committee approval for conducting the review and systematic reviewers systematic reviews also have a higher acceptance rate in journals so if, if students were to focus their effort on conducting systematic reviews i think this will give you a much higher probability of getting published in a good journal on first submission and it also avoids the other regulatory bureaucratic and cultural barriers that may exist if you're going to do studies with data collection directly from patients and communities all right so that's systematic review <clears throat> in since since my move to the uk in 1995 i have been moving down south first i was in scotland then i was in the midlands in a city called birmingham uh, during that time i was a consultant in the national health service delivering babies on labor ward and running clinics <clears throat> i was also editor of various journals that i showed you in uh, pictures on the slide i also wrote a book on how to conduct systematic reviews in 2010 i moved to london where i was uh, again also a consultant i became professor in university in uh, 19 uh, in, in in 2005 um, the way research and clinical practice interact with each other is variable between countries cultures continents It is possible that as medical students, you may see your role as a professional in the coming years, mainly as an individual who is providing care to sick patients. But medicine also offers a great deal of flexibility in what you can do at different stages in your professional life. So once I was a university professor in 2005, I, at that time, was engaged in a lot of large research projects involving many hospitals, many countries, many continents. So at the same time, to continue to provide clinical care to patients individually with a high, with a high, de, high level of personal <clears throat> attention to each individual patient, over time became more and more difficult and i also realized maybe 
looking after patients by providing them care directly is not the only way to improve healthcare. <clears throat> the researchers have a, a fantastic gift. As a clinical doctor, you only face one patient at a time and you can make a difference to one individual and their family. For a researcher with one publication, you can make a difference to millions of people. Because when your paper is published and it changes the clinical protocol and policy of a health system, a hospital, a clinic, not just one, but hundreds and thousands of people immediately can benefit. So this was what attracted me to devote more time to research. And about five years ago, I started to work 100% as a researcher. And this year, just before coronavirus epidemic <clears throat> became pandemic, I moved to University of Granada. Uh, um, I mean, it may, it may, may or may not be of interest, but because of my research experience, uh, I was invited to be a member of the Pakistan government's scientific committee concerning coronavirus. So while I don't see individual patients admitted in intensive care with coronavirus, the research I am engaged in with respect to coronavirus affects hundreds and thousands of patients within Pakistan. So I would like you to be able to see research as a way not just of putting two additional lines on your CV in the publication section, <clears throat> but as a way of making real difference to the life of patients. So I hope that makes sense. So this year I moved to University of Granada. Uh, do you know where does the <clears throat> idea of uh, putting water inside a courtyard, like in the building at AKU, Stadium Road. Where does that idea come from? It comes from a building you see at my back on one side of the picture, the Alhambra Palace. So this palace was built with the idea that you have small entrances to courtyards and each courtyard has a water feature because over here, the heat of the summer is the same as the heat of the summer in Karachi. The university here where I work is 500 years old and its first building is called the Madrasa because this university was established, its origin was in in the, in, in the times of the Muslims they spent in uh, Spain. So here I show you <clears throat> the number of citations to my papers. I've published more than 400 papers. As an editor, I have evaluated more than 10,000 papers. Uh, and my, my own papers have been cited more than 20 thousand times by other researchers. I have been invited to present seminars like this one, uh, not by internet, but in face-to-face -face meetings in more than 37 countries. Um, for me, this is good. I can spread the word about how to do research and good research and publish papers. But the most important thing for me in my research 
is this orange line. <clears throat> so this slide shows uh, from 1990 onwards till now, the number of papers I've published. And for each paper, the number of patients who are in the study, for example, in this first study, maybe there are only under 100 patients. But here there is a study of one and a half thousand patients. Here is a study of more than 5,000 patients. It is another study of more than 5,000 patients. The largest study I have ever done has more than 20,000 patients. And if I add all of these numbers of patients up during the course of my research who have given their data for the benefit of other patients, then this number is uh, nearly 70 million. So research doesn't just happen by sitting in an office in front of a laptop. It happens because patients give consent for use of their data to help the society. So the most important people in research are not the researchers. The most important people in research are the people who give their data. This is the greatest privilege I have had as a researcher to be able to use people's data with which to publish papers and with that to then improve healthcare. Okay, so we now move on to um, <clears throat> what is a medical journal, what editors like, what you as authors would like, what your clinicians, what your readers, the clinicians would like, how to write the abstract and how to write the title and introduction. Okay. <clears throat> So a journal normally has an owner. The owner employs some staff who run the administrative work of the journal and a chief editor. And the owner also appoints a publisher. The chief editor appoints an editorial board and editors. They follow the instructions of organizations like International Committee of Medical Journal Editors or Committee of Publication Ethics. With this, they create a strategy for the journal. When you submit your paper, it goes through an assessment according to the strategy. And 90% of the time it will be rejected because the rejection rate in most journals of even medium quality is around 80-90%. And the 10% that are accepted then become publications. These publications are put together on a website with PDF files, and this is called a journal. So you see these green dotted lines. The, all the stuff concerning research and publication is happening over here. The publisher has nothing to do with it. They simply put together the PDF files into a journal. The owner of the journal should have nothing to do with it. The process of assessment of papers should be an independent process run according to some set principles and strategy. You, as an author, are submitting the paper you don't want it to be rejected and thrown out. You want it to move over here in this section. That is your objective. <clears throat> this is uh, the Committee of Medical Journal Editors, Committee on Publication Ethics. There are different types of journals, open access. Open access itself is of different types. Beware that there are also predatory journals whose job is to make money by offering publication. Uh, this journal, when I was the chief editor, contained more than 40 editors. So we received 
1,600 papers a year, 40 plus people assessed it, and we rejected 88% of them. So this is what the author is up against. The author is up against these people. These are the editors of a journal. I show you a diagram of human beings because these assessments are made by individuals who don't just assess science, but they also have their own feelings, opinions, experiences. So you, you as author might think that your audience is the reader, the clinician who will read your paper. But actually your audience is not them. Your audience is the editors because if they reject your paper, it will never reach the clinician. So you should get to know the editors because guess what? They have the power to throw you out of the match. Just like a cricket umpire does or a football referee does. So these editors are in fact umpires and referees. In fact, peer reviewers and referee is a common word used for people who assess papers. So I'd like to just stop here just for a moment and see if people have any comments or questions. And I would like to also see how the system of interaction with colleagues will work. Um, if you guys have any questions at any time, you guys can use the raise your hand feature and then we'll unmute you and you can go ahead and ask any question. And if not, um, if you're not comfortable being unmuted, you can definitely put your question inside the chat box as well. So I, I have the chat box open in front of me. There are only two comments which are by the organizers. Uh, I'm quite happy to receive any comments made in the chat. I presume people can also unmute their microphone and ask their question. Is that possible? Um, yeah, they can raise their hands and then we can unmute them. Okay, please uh, do. Okay, so here is a question on the chat. It's a question, by well, there is another one coming. That's good, very good, thank you. <clears throat> uh, question by Saad, what do you mean by predatory journals? How can we know them and avoid them? So, well, the answer is simple. There is, uh, well, first of all, a predatory journal is one which will promise, will, which will take your money in order to publish a paper. It will not necessarily put it through a proper peer review process. Uh, and even though you might get it published, it will be of no value to you, your career, or to your patients in the end, because this type of a journal is not a recognized journal. And there is a list called the Beals list. And this list is, I would recommend one that you can use. I'm sure there will be others on the internet, but this is the one that I would recommend you use if you want to know whether you are being conned by a predatory journal. Uh, Maybe you know that Pakistan itself has nearly 100 medical journals. About 74% of them, about 70 or 74 of them are recognized by the medical council. The others are not recognized or in the process of being recognized or have been rejected and will reapply. So look at journal credentials before you make a submission to them. If you write to the editor, uh, there is a question from, uh, from Mir Rafe. Uh, is it a good idea to write an unsolicited sub email or submission to the editor before formal submission. <clears throat> I'm paraphrasing it. I don't think it is a good idea. The editor of a journal normally is a busy individual who does the work for the journal for free. 
in their free time, not in their normal working time. They are not an employee of the journal, usually. <clears throat> they don't have to, time to read unsolicited messages. So I would not encourage uh, this type of uh, approach. It might even annoy them. So it might have the opposite effect of what you want to achieve. Use the formal process of the journal that they have advertised. Another question is, are all recognized journals peer reviewed? The answer is no. You will need to check what process each journal uses. Uh, I think in Pakistan for medical council recognition or higher education commission recognition, it is necessary that the journal should have peer review. But guess what? What is peer review? Well, the peer reviewer shouldn't be a friend of the author, shouldn't be a friend of the editor, should be an independent expert. Identifying these people and convincing them to provide peer review is not easy. And peer reviewers are also busy people who offer their assessment or refereeing, usually for free. So they are also doing this stuff in their free time. It's not easy for a journal to create a pool of high quality peer reviewers. So that's why I urge you to pay attention to the merits and demerits of the journal where you intend to submit. Question is, what is the best way to start with a systematic review? Sometimes it's quite difficult to find a mentor. Well, Pavan, if you are at Aga Khan University, the SRF should go to the dean and make a request on behalf of the students to say, please, amongst your employees who teach us, can you get some of them to acquire expertise in systematic reviews so they can be our mentors. This would be, in your situation, the best way. Um, I am sure in your faculty, there are some people who are already published systematic reviewers. You can approach them if they have an ongoing project and join their team. Um, that's all I can say. I think you can ask me. I can give you some comments on your questions in this presentation or outside this presentation through my uh, <clears throat> through a, through a platform that I have concerning publications and systematic reviews called Health Education Research via social media on LinkedIn. That would work. Um, you can also buy my book on systematic reviews. That could help too. Um, then next question is by Zafar, Shanyal Zafar. Is it true that qualitative studies carry a generally higher rate of approval? Well, I think the opposite is true. Qualitative studies have a higher rate of approval among social scientists, not necessarily amongst medical scientists. If you think about it, in very general terms, there are two types of research. One is, answers the question, what happened to people? Or what did people do? These are observational studies. Qualitative study is a type of observational study. And another type of research is, answers the question, what should we do in the future. This type of study is called an experimental study or applied research study. So the first type of study does nothing to change anything. 
because simply by making observations, you don't change anything, right? To change something, you need to do a study that creates an intervention that will be used in the future. So applied research is what changes things. Observational research usually does not change much. Well, there are some circumstances when observational studies will and can bring about change. Uh, but usually it is the experimental studies or applied research studies that are at the forefront of people who invest in research. Um, and with this information, it's possible to determine what doctors and patients should do in the future. What doctors, patients, nurses, midwives, radiographers, healthcare assistants should do in the future. I hope that makes sense. Okay, shall we move on? Yes, I think we can move on. And then people who have questions can continue putting it in the chat or use their, or unmute their mic after. Okay, Yeah. thank you. Um, let's go back to the slides. So we have already spent about 40 minutes. Is, is, uh, is the pace too slow? Well, maybe it is. I'll speed up a little and if it is too fast, then let me know. We have till seven o'clock. So we have an hour and 20 more minutes. So then you can pace yourself based on that. Accordingly, okay, very good, thank you. Um, so these are some of the things that go wrong in research. People can present their own positive findings and not report the negative findings. They can claim they are making unexpected findings. They can cheat <clears throat> during the course of the study or after. <clears throat> Editors want to pick this type of problem up. If this type of problem is picked up, there can be sanctions. But the first important thing is to recognize that uh, <clears throat> these are four examples. Plagiarism, duplicate publication, salami. These are the different definitions. I won't go in detail, uh, except with plagiarism. When you submit a paper, the journal normally would put it through authenticate or turn it in or some other such software. And in this paper, one can see that 34% of the paper, the text of 34% of the paper exists somewhere else or has a source somewhere else or an original source is somewhere else. So it can appear that there has been copying, word by word copying of text. So this is called plagiarism. One of the email questions was, how can one avoid getting into problems with it? <clears throat> I think the, the, these are my three, three pieces of advice. Reference the original source. Use your own words to describe what somebody else has written. And if you are going to copy the original text, use inverted commas to show that you have taken the text from someone else. If you have done these two or three things, then I think you will stay free of problems related to plagiarism. <clears throat> okay, frequently authors think that peer reviewers reject papers. But actually that is not true. A lot of the papers are just rejected by authors by editors even without sending it to referees. So this emphasizes even more that uh, your audience is, your real audience is the editor. You need to get through the editor in order to get published, in order to be read by others. So give you an example of a study I was involved in. The idea was conceived in 1996. 
recruitment of patients started in 1998. Data, patient recruitment finished in 2006. The write-up of the manuscript started in 2006 and published in 2009. So you can see the life of an important large piece of study is long. That's one reason why I advise you to consider doing systematic reviews because they can be, depending on the number of studies to be included, completed within a few months. Your idea is to have your paper converted from a Word file into a published PDF file as soon as possible. You want to receive this kind of an email. I am pleased to accept your manuscript. Your paper will be published within seven to 10 days, etc. <clears throat> but your readers have a different objective. Their objective is to combine their knowledge and experience about patient care with the knowledge you publish in your scientific articles so that they can engage in evidence-based practice. So the papers are the E of the evidence-based medicine. It's a noble endeavor to write papers because without it, evidence-based medicine is not possible. Here are the four steps of evidence-based medicine. And you can see that identification of papers, appraisal of the papers, and using to put them in practice are the key steps. The paper has this structure. <clears throat> it's called IMRAD. Starts with the title page and abstract, then the IMRED, which is introduction, methods, results, and discussion. And then acknowledgments, references, and tables, and so on. And the initial assessment is based only on these three things, usually. So nobody reads your cover letter. Nobody reads your results section. Nobody reads your discussion section your title, abstract, and introduction have the strongest influence on the initial assessment by the editors. So this is what you really need to focus on when uh, writing. The process of research from clinical problem to change in practice is long. And the development of the idea, question formulation and study design all of these initial steps give you clues to what could be in the title of your paper. <clears throat> so let's look at what is the research question. Uh, you can see question formulation is the second step after the first idea comes forward. Because if you cannot formulate a question in a scientific manner, you cannot proceed with a study. So here you see an image. The idea comes in my mind, is the driver a man or a woman? And I want to convert this into a scientific question. I will use this headings. The participants are drivers of this BMW. The competitors are other drivers. The test is the way they fill petrol in the car. And to check the gender, well, I could use a blood sample to check chromosomes, but I could also do psychological tests or examine the attire or hair style. With this question and a particular study design, I can in fact now conduct a research project and answer my question. So this process of framing the question in a manner that can be subjected to a scientific study is the first step. We frequently hear the term cohort and case control study. Case control study is a very confusing term. In a cohort study, basically, we take people, we follow them up, 
we measure their exposure to something, whether they are smoking or not smoking, follow them up to see whether they develop cancer or they do not develop cancer. And then with that information, we can determine whether cancer is related to experience of or exposure to smoking. This study moves forward in time in follow-up of patients and is called a cohort study. Case control study starts with the outcome, whether you have cancer are the cases, then you collect con healthy controls who do not have cancer. And you ask both of them, maybe with a questionnaire, how much did you smoke in the last 10 years or 20 years? And here you can see that the direction of time travel is backwards. And this study where the starting point is the determination of the outcome. And we go back in time to see exposure before we can determine the effect. This type of study is a case control study. Also note that the term control is used inside a cohort study, but control exposure does not make the cohort study a case control study. It is the control with respect to outcome that makes a case control study a case control study. So if we ask the question in coronavirus pandemic, do people exposed have a risk of lymphoproliferative disorder? Uh, the exposure is test PCR test for corona positive or negative. The outcome is a disorder confirmed by laboratory tests like histology and the design could be cohort or case control. Make sense? We can identify people with lymphoproliferative disorder. We can identify a healthy control group. For each one of them, we can go back in time and see if they were exposed to coronavirus by presence or absence of a positive PCR test result. Make sense? This information from the question concerning participants, exposure outcome and design <clears throat> can be used to construct the title of your paper. So I show you a title about the moon landing Many years of work, billions of dollars of expenditure, engagement of tens of thousands of people and hundreds of companies, all of this summarized in just three words. Just three words on the moon. Where are your keywords that should be in your title of your paper? Well, first of all, the title should not be too long. And it should use the keywords for inclusion in your title are the keywords from your question. So I show you a title of one of my papers. Here you can see the study design is in the title. Here you can see the intervention is in the title outcome, maybe not. Another paper study design is in the title intervention is in the title outcome is also in the title. Another paper study design is there. Intervention is there, outcome is there. So you want to grab the attention of the reader and the, and the editor and the peer reviewer by using the words that are your keywords for your research question. When do people write the abstract? Normally they write it just before online submission. I suggest that this can be written when writing the protocol registration of the study or at the first step of writing the manuscript. Don't wait until just your submission. The abstract has these subheadings. The abstract should be structured. It should be standalone. It should avoid abbreviation, should follow the instructions of the journal. So the information concerning your question goes inside the objectives. This information is then repeated 
in the last paragraph of the introduction with the information concerning study design. <clears throat> so you can now see how important it is to frame the question correctly because this information will be read in the title, it will be read in the abstract, and it will be read in the first page of the main text when the reader is coming to the end of the introduction. <clears throat> Here is an abstract submitted from one of my previous papers. It looks like it's following the structure but actually, when it is accepted and edited, you can already see that there are so many changes in it. So try not to write the abstract as the last thing before submission. Try to write it the first thing. <clears throat> so you can edit it as many times as possible before, before actual submission. <clears throat> Here are some guidelines on how to write manuscripts and on a website called Equator. Each type of study, randomized trial, observational study, systematic review, qualitative studies as well, all have instructions or checklists on what should be reported. So use these checklists. Even submit the checklist with your manuscript as an appendix that will be appreciated by the editor and peer reviewer. And these checklists tend to be something of this kind. They ask you to do this in the title. And when you've done this, you just report the page number of the manuscript over here. Structured summary, page number. Rationale, have you given it? Give the page number. So with by reporting the page number, you more or less confirm that you have reported this in your manuscript. And this is what editors are looking for. You can see that in the abstract, they are asking you to submit information about study design methods and results. And all of these things relate to stuff that you have to do even before you start collecting the data, except the only thing you don't have in the beginning is the result. You have your design, you have your methods. So there is no excuse for saying, well, I'll wait till I have my results to write the abstract. Well, results will be only three or four lines of the abstract. Most of the abstract will be your question and your study design and your methods. So you can just write them even before you start writing, doing the study. <clears throat> in the future, even today, but in more in the future, not only will you be expected to give an abstract in writing, but you may also be expected to give a video abstract. Clinical and, trials and here is one example. Of female representation. <clears throat> This has caused growing scientific and political concern because women's health is of global importance. For example, worldwide, over 130 million babies are born each year. However, only a tiny proportion of these women participate in research studies. We conducted a study to explore the benefit arising from participation in randomized controlled trials across different interventions available to women of reproductive age. Women in trials had 25% better odds of improved health outcomes, on average, when compared to those outside trials. Our findings indicate that those who participate in research trials benefit themselves in the process. Armed with this knowledge, women themselves should be empowered to strive to participate in research. So you can see that uh, there is now a requirement more or less to prepare material in such a way that it's not just traditionally distributed by, a, by scientific platforms, but also distributed via social media and other related means. 
So we now move to introduction. <clears throat> In the introduction, we already said the last paragraph will contain the objective and design. The first paragraph will contain disease information about disease burden. The idea is to show the importance of the topic, and you can do that by including <coughs> information concerning disease burden as measured by prevalence or suffering or economic cost. And you can do that by looking for systematic reviews on the topic in the literature. So these are the key things that go in the first paragraph. This is not a book chapter. You only need to write six lines or eight lines, two or three lines each for prevalence, life quality, and cost of cost of the disease. Then you need to say, why did you do the study? Well, there are only three reasons for doing a study. Well, either, either there is no such study before, either the existing studies are of poor quality, or the existing papers are too old. In order to justify your study, according to one or more of these criteria, you will need to be sure from having performed a systematic search that what you say is verifiable. It's not just your own opinion about your own work, but it can be independently checked if somebody did a search of PubMed, for example. <clears throat> okay, when you talk about quality of uh, other studies, frequently you have to criticize other papers. But if you just give a few seconds of thought to it, the authors of other papers could also be your peer reviewers. Because people published in the same topic where you are trying to publish will be asked to peer review your paper. So you cannot just say negative things about other people's work who are in a position of power about decision making concerning your paper. Does that make sense? So I suggest the way to go about it is, I show you with an example, here is a paper. There is already a published systematic review on this topic. The discussion section of any paper should have something written about the limitations of that paper. So what you can do is take the previously published paper, pick up its reported limitation by the author themselves, and just put that in the second paragraph of your introduction. And you can use inverted commas and references to the original source, and this way, if the peer reviewers happen to be the author of this paper that you are wanting to criticize, they will be able to see that you have written what they wrote. So instead of being upset with you, they will be happy with you. Makes sense? Okay, so we stop here for a moment. We've covered title, abstract, and introduction. We've covered the research question. We've covered study design. And we've covered some tricks on how to write the difficult text of the second paragraph of introduction, where there is a risk that the study you need to criticize in order to justify your own study could be the study that is written by your own peer reviewer. So at this stage, let's see what questions and comments we have. Yes, if anyone wants to unmute them, I can ask a question. They can raise their hands and we'll unmute.
Um, I actually have a question. This was a question. Yeah, that, please go ahead. Yeah, this was an, a question that was asked by someone um, before the session. Um, they asked that how can they change the language of the manuscript to be more, I guess you could say professional and suit the style of the audience. Like essentially, what is the language of the manuscript supposed to be like? What kind of style is it supposed to be like? So, well, uh, people say the best way to become a good author is to first become a good reader. So my advice is to read published papers in high ranking journals. You will then, having read a few papers, you will immediately see that these papers have a language of, uh, of science written with precision. And then you just need to, in your own writing, start to write in that way. That, this, is, this would be my advice. The, as, I, as I was saying a moment ago, <clears throat> I've read more than 10,000 manuscripts as editor. And I can assure you that some of the worst manuscripts that I've read have come from native English speakers. So the language of science is the language of science, not the language of a country. And science is universal. So anybody who can learn the language of science can write good science. Um, they do not have to be a native speaker to be able to write a good scientific paper. I hope that addresses the, the comment. Okay, shall we move on? Yes, I think we'll move forward and then people can continue, of course, putting questions in the chat box. Yeah. Yeah. So next I want to talk a little bit about tables and figures. So once your paper has been read and thought to be suitable, the next thing will be that the editor or peer reviewer will turn to figures and tables because they want to verify what you have said in the abstract is in fact repeated or shown by, by, uh, by data in the figures and tables. So, Pay attention to detail in figures and tables. Figure and table also need to be standalone like the abstract. So here is the figure. You can see that not only is this giving data, but it's also giving evidence sources with a reference. It's also giving an explanation of what the symbols mean. Not just saying, please read the read the methods. Here's a slide which shows that actually figures are more accurately and more quickly read by readers. So try and get figures in instead of tables. And here's advice on how figures should be prepared. So caption need to be detailed. The key thing are define all the data, um, define every unit, the reader should not have to turn to methods or text in order to understand the graph. And these figures and graphs, I would suggest also avoid three dimensional graphs because they tend to be a little confusing. Here is an example of a figure which is more or less showing you data that could be easily presented in tables with numbers and percentages. But here it's possible to show all that information by putting the number inside the bar chart. And this way you can demonstrate also to the editor that you are making an effort more than a standard author. 
the idea here is to convince the editor and the more you can show them that you're making an effort, more effort than an average author, then the greater is the chance that you will be accepted. So, I'd like to now just move to the next section, which is about uh, which is about discussion. But before that, if there are any questions on figures and tables, let's address them. And if there aren't any, then no worries. <clears throat> One of the questions I'm frequently asked is, how should I select a journal? So here I have some tips for that. You need to think about what is your objective. So if your audience is uh, people related to your desired place of residency in the future, and you want them to read your paper ahead of applying for the residency, then select a journal that people in those places actually read. Try to target that journal. And that way you have a better chance that uh, they will get to know you even before you turn up at their door with your residency application. So this I think is an important feature to consider who is your target audience once your paper is accepted. And that target audience after acceptance is uh, usually related to some professional objective. Uh, so work according to your professional objectives in selecting the journal. Okay, we move now to discussion. Uh, before that, you will need to write methods and results. But for methods and results, the only thing I can say is that each method and each result for each study is unique. So it's almost impossible to give any general advice about what should be in there, other than whatever is there should address your question. It should let the editor know that you present the findings as directed by your question. So I take you an example of a paper which I submitted many years ago, 2006, is when it was published, it was submitted in September 2005. It was immediately rejected because it did not follow the instructions of the journal. It was resubmitted after rejection and then sent out for peer review. On resubmission the, uh, and peer review, it could be that it will be, be recommended for rejection or there may be a split decision between the peer reviewers. So some might say accept and others might say reject. And this decision will be driven by knowledge of how good your study is. And this type of an assessment is made by looking at these items in the checklist that I recommended to you that you should consider uh, when you prepare your manuscript. So coming to the discussion, <clears throat> the key thing about discussion is that it should also be structured like the abstract. So using the guidance given in this published paper, 
we can think of four subheadings. Main findings, strengths, weaknesses, comparison, mean, meanings of findings and conclusion. So the main findings will come from the results reported in the abstract. So here is an example. Here are the results in the abstract. And the same results are reported here in the main findings of the published paper, but they are without any numbers. So this conversion is simple. You take 68% from abstract and call it two thirds. So the change is more or less straightforward. It follows naturally. How to convert numbers into words is the trick. The next thing is conclusion. This comes from the conclusion of the abstract also. So here is the conclusion written in the abstract and the text is almost identical. You can just add a few more lines after repeating the same line that was in the conclusion of the abstract. The introduction you had referred to some studies, some previous studies, you can use those studies again, but this time you compare your results with the results of those studies. In the introduction, you were only commenting on their methods, not on their results, because you were highlighting their weaknesses. Here you have a chance in discussion to compare your findings with their findings. In the second paragraph called strengths and weaknesses, you need to explain how strong your methods are. So I'll give you an example. If you need to say that your study has some limitation, please give it with a positive ending. So don't just say this is a limitation of my study. They also say what you did about this limitation. So here is another example. <clears throat> you convert these negative words into positive words. So here you are explaining that there is a limitation, but I have done something about it. This then leads us to the last section, which is meanings of the findings. And in the meaning of the findings, you've got to explain how this information is helpful for the patients. Also, you can say something about how this information can be useful to guide future research. So here are the five uh, paragraphs of discussion. So with this, I think I will bring my presentation to close <clears throat> because I think the issue of dealing with peer reviewers is uh, possibly for another day. Uh, we'll stay here and <clears throat> take your questions. Y a la mancha de Creta, usted sábado, restricciones de nivel 3 para las cuatro localidades de Toledo con más intercambio. Um, we have a question in the chat box. Um, okay. Um, yeah, so someone asked if it's a good idea to add subheadings to the discussion and the results and also to the methods. <clears throat> Let's see what is the exact wording. Uh, the question is... Yes, definitely. All three sections should have subheadings. It makes it, it makes reading very much easier. So also I would give a couple of other pieces of advice uh, concerning the write-up. Please always introduce an extra space, extra line, extra empty line between paragraphs. It makes it easier to read. Subheadings serve the same purpose. It makes it easier to read. The subheadings in addition give a logical order to the information. So yes, please do use subheadings in methods, in results, and in discussion, all three. 
In introduction, usually subheadings are not used or not permitted, uh, but that is okay. Introduction is usually a very short section, no more than one to one and a half page with only three paragraphs. Um, there is a question about letter to the editor. For this, can I just take you to my web page? Because on my Facebook page, there is already advice on how to write a letter to the editor. So, So I showed you earlier that uh, <clears throat> nearly 90% of papers are rejected. But the rejection rate is only 10% for letters to the editor. So this is the advice that exists on my <clears throat> Facebook page. My advice is that you should take a recent journal article that is important because the letter to the editor for an article published last year will not be attractive to the to the journal take a recent it is inevitable that any article has some weakness pick up that weakness and use that weakness to construct your letter and within a couple of weeks of submitting your letter, you will find that it is accepted for publication. And within a few weeks after that, it will appear in PubMed as a citation. So all 42 of you who are attending this uh, session he, uh, uh, can, within a period of a month, all put a smile on your face with two lines with your name appearing in PubMed. What do you do? You write the, for, in the following way. The first line starts with giving a reference to the article. You will say something like, I read this article with the reference given with interest. And say something positive about it. It, is, it addresses an important health condition that is prevalent. Now you have already started with a positive uh, as far as the author and the editor is concerned. Next, you write, what is it that you think was annoying, weak, or something that triggered you to write the letter? That could be a weakness in blinding. It could be a weakness in follow-up. It could be a weakness in objectivity of outcome measure. Any one of these items could be the source or the trigger for writing this letter. You then say a few words about how this thing that triggered you to write the letter creates a problem, creates a difficulty in interpretation. Describe what the difficulty is. Give some references to back your argument with respect to the difficulty. So this type of a weakness identified by you, reported in a positive way, backed by references, will be taken positively by the editor. And in the last sentence, you simply conclude by saying that you would like to see the response of the author uh, with respect to the point you have highlighted because hopefully it will help clarify for other readers in the future as to how the paper could be better interpreted. Then just add your name and affiliation, use grammar check and spell check, 
go to the website of the journal and upload your manuscript and then that's it that's your letter to the editor i can offer to read and comment on a letter to the editor written by any of you um, after this session is over right so i hope that addresses the question concerning uh, letter to the editor well if you cannot find the original source you should not cite you should not cite something where you have not been able to assess the original source so that was one of the questions uh well is there any other alternate way well what can i say if there is a something that exists in reality or well, you keep looking for it till you find it or use another citation for which the original source is available to you i i i hope that helps uh, mohammed safter is it acceptable to frequently cite the same researcher that we mentioned in the introduction well look the issue of citation in the literature of the literature in the introduction and the discussion is that these citations have be re, have to be related to your work so it is inevitable that whatever you cite in the introduction is suitable for also citing in the discussion the only difference is that you you cite different elements of the same paper so the introduction would normally deal with methods of the previous or of the previous study whereas the discussion would deal with results of the previous study or another aspect a uh, comment made by the author in their own discussion that could be uh, or a letter written about that paper by another researcher could be a citation this the story develops a, but it has to develop around your own topic so unless your topic has a zillion citations um but in any case <clears throat> relevant citations would very likely appear both in introduction and discussion then another question is would it be advisable as ah, you also in the previous question the you are concerned about repetition so look we are not writing a novel we are writing science here repetition is expected for example when you are writing your methods and results <clears throat> it is expected that it is written in the abstract it's also expected that it is also written in the method section and the result section it's also expected that the result sections also appear in the tables and figures then it's also expected that the same results appear again in discussion and the methods and your comments on the methods also appear again in discussion so the repetition is the name of the game in this type of writing so please don't be afraid of <coughs> repeating the citations <coughs> except you just have to be careful that you're not repeating the same idea or exactly the same words i mean even repetition of exactly the same words is permitted between abstract and main text so please don't be fearful of repetition in writing next question is would it be advisable to mention every limitation of our study in the discussion or will that decrease our chances of acceptance uh, if you do not mention the limitations of your study that will decrease the chances of getting accepted the editors are usually experienced researchers 
they know that no study is conducted without any flaw. Every study has some flaw. So it makes no sense for you as an author not to talk about a flaw of your study, which the editor expects to read about. He will be or she will be disappointed if this information is missing. So please talk about the, your limitations. <clears throat> but as I explained in my slides, <clears throat> give them a positive ending. You say this is a problem, but then you also explain how you interpret this in light of what you have found or what you have done. <clears throat> okay, there's another question about how how important is it to take permission before using a tool? Not all tools need permission. I mean, what, what, <clears throat> what permissions are needed? Well, basically you just, uh, when a paper is already published, it's in the public domain. If you cite the source, then you can use the tool. There is no, there's no problem with it unless the tool states that it is copyrighted and the permission of the copywriter should be obtained. In that case, you will need to write to whoever the copyright holder is. Um, well, if they are retired or dead, well, you still just write the email. You may not get any answer or you might get an answer from the person to whom they have transferred the copyright. But your task as an author is to seek the permission. The fact that they never replied to you is their fault. It's not your responsibility to reply on their behalf. So when you submit your paper, you can say to the editor, I sought the permission as was required, but I did or did not get the answer depending on what happened. <clears throat> Well, you definitely should need, would need to cite another, uh, the original source of the scale or the survey that used from another author. If nothing else, it will show that you respect other authors and that will be taken well uh, by the editors, that you are respecting of other people in your own field of research. That was a question by Dr by Aziza. I, ho I hope my answer addresses your uh, question. I think with that I've come to the end of the chat list, the questions in the chat. <clears throat> Are there any questions that were sent to you in the email, that were sent to me by email that I have failed to cover so far? Let's have a look at the email. <clears throat> well, the question about the second question, well, this one about what aspect of research made me think about becoming a researcher? <clears throat> Is for me, the applied part of research, that with research you can immediately and effectively make a difference to the lives of hundreds and thousands of people is what was most attractive to me. I think on this question I have already advised that I believe systematic reviews are a <clears throat> good way to go at your stage in the career. Concerning in polishing your manuscript writing skills. Well, use some of the tricks I've given you with respect to introduction and discussion. Use the checklists in the equator for writing methods and results. 
and read a lot of papers, not just to read about what is it that is reported, but how it is written. Well, I see what you are saying, renowned doctors. I mean, what is renown? I don't know what is renown. But I, I understand what you mean. You mean people who you look up to appear not to give research importance. Is that what is meant, I presume? Well, what can I say? I mean, <clears throat> you, you realize that you can be more right than your teachers. A student can in time be better than their teachers. If these people don't give importance to something that is important, that does not mean that you just have to follow what they deliver to you. You can develop your own image, opinion, ideas, work with them, and keep going to do stuff in which you believe. <clears throat> the only one the only person you are responsible for, the only person whose actions and beliefs and thoughts and activity and effort you are responsible is yourself. You are not responsible for, for what your teacher believes. If you believe that research is a good thing to do, then don't worry about what other people believe, even if they are your teachers. You take responsibility for your own belief. You take responsibility for acting according to your belief. As a non-clinician, well, the good news is some of the most important health researchers are in fact non-clinicians. So the idea that you have to be a doctor in order to be a good researcher or a nurse to be a good researcher does not apply. Good research is delivered by good research methods, not by clinical training. I hope that addresses this point about uh, non-clinician. The question also is, how do I gain hands-on hands -on practice in research at international level? Well, if you think about doing a systematic review, Like a, a systematic review, a research project is, any research project is ideally suitable for a team effort. One person cannot do a whole research project. They usually need to work with others. Maybe you can find others who you work with abroad. That could start to create your international um, links. I believe on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn, there are already platforms for clinical trials, for, for research students, for systematic reviews. Enter those platforms. I wrote my first email in 1994. This was six years after graduating from medical school. 
I did not have the opportunity to be able to do an international research project while being a medical student. You have that opportunity today. Grab that, grab that opportunity. That opportunity does not require you to have your hand held by your teacher. You can just take the initiative and go forward. People exist like you, who you will find via social media. These groups already exist. We already talked about this plagiarism we have talked about. How do I know the manuscript is of a standard level for publishing? Well, check what you have written against the checklist available in the equator guidelines. So if you're writing a review, use the Prisma checklist. If it's a trial, use the consort checklist. If it's an observational study, use the stroke checklist. Then you will know. <clears throat> Can research be done without data collection? Yes, of course, research can be done without data collection. If you mean data collection from patients, then the answer is yes. You can do research by collecting data from published papers. How to write a letter? I think we've covered that. How to find the time to do research? Hmm. Well, that's to me a question of priority. Anything that you prioritize, you can find time for it. You cannot change that a day has 24 hours, but you can change your priority. So if you prioritize research, you will find time within the 24 hours available in a day. Then there is also a question related to how different is participating in research abroad compared to Pakistan? Uh, this is to some extent a difficult question for me to answer now because of two reasons. Number one, I may have traveled 37 countries to teach about research, but there are more than 200 countries in the world. And it's not necessary that my experience Experience can address the question as put to me. I think I can generally say that for people studying medicine or nursing, research is not given a high priority. A small proportion of us usually based on our own initiative, become interested and then go forward with it. And then again, based on our own initiative, develop more training, understanding and career in this direction. And I presume the same is true for colleagues in Pakistan. So that's... Uh, so the second reason why I could not give an answer properly is that I have not been in Pakistan now, working in Pakistan now for many years. So I believe the culture in Pakistan itself has changed compared to the time when I was a student and a doctor. Um, it may be of interest for you to know that amongst low middle income countries, Pakistan has the highest per capita output of science published. The second country after Pakistan is Egypt and then there are others. So I am proud as a Pakistani to present this information whenever I have a chance to talk about how low middle income countries are investing in research. I think Pakistan in the last 10 years has a landscape for research completely different and extremely advanced relative to 30 years ago when I was just completing my internship. So I think you are growing up in a country where the environment for research 
exists and is far better than the past generations. But what are your own comments about what I just said? How do you feel about your environment concerning research? Please feel free to make comments. I promise to keep them confidential. Um, someone in the chat, uh, Mahin, she actually says that it's mostly quantity over quality. So I guess what she might mean to say is that a bunch of pe papers are being churned out, but what's really important from that paper is like, is the content of those papers even good? Is what, what's being produced even worthwhile and important to the research community? Uh, look, my comment in response is, if you are interested in research, then you give the importance to quality. You have the power in your own hand and in the team around you to change this. And this problem of quantity over quality is not a unique problem for Pakistan. 90% of the papers published in the Lancet have no clinical value whatsoever. Only a very small proportion of papers have the quality with which applied clinical practice can be improved. So this statement, please don't use this statement of quantity over quality to beat yourself up. A CV boosting activity. Well, you don't, Mahin, you don't have to be the one who does the CV boosting activity. You can be the one who really want to understand and focus on the things that when published will change practice. I'll give you an example. Uh, about 15 years ago, we did a study on uh, how to detect congenital heart disease in the newborn. The study was very simple. Use pulse oximetry of the newborn to check the level. And if the level is low, do additional tests to check if they have a congenital heart disease. Turned out to be a fantastic good screening test. Today, it is part of the national policy of many countries, many, many countries. and is driven and this policy decision is driven by the research we did in our group in Birmingham. In addition, other people also did research in this field. But ours was one of the largest studies that pushed the agenda forward. Do this type of study. This is what you're talking about, Mahin, isn't it? Get quality, get large numbers of patients, and this is how you make an impact. Mahin, do you want to unmute your mic and say something in word? I'd be interested to hear what you have to say. In the meantime, somebody commented, uh, Nakash, Heather, about 7% of plagiarism on Turnitin. I think 7% is not very high. You don't need to worry about it. This will be okay. Should I proceed? You, yes, you can proceed with submission. Please go ahead. 7% is okay. Uh, was, did Mahin want you to say something? Um, Mahin, I think I unmuted you. Oh, yeah, please uh, go ahead, Mahin. Hold on. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you so much for that presentation, Dr. Khalid. It was wonderful and I learned quite a lot. Um, and I absolutely agree. The quality, uh, the quantity over quant quality is a problem everywhere in the world. Um, I'm just worried because now, um, especially for our generation, research has become 
such an important thing to have on your CV for residency or even to move up the ladder to be taken seriously in the medical field that I believe that it's not being given the importance that maybe was given earlier on. It's no longer about passion. It's more about it being a prerequisite to actually be in a position in the future where you would be taken seriously. I don't know if that makes any sense. Well, it makes sense. Look, the Student Research Forum did not exist 30 years ago when I was, 35 years ago when I was a student at AKU. Now you have a forum. Uh, I was pleasantly surprised that people at student level are so enthusiastically engaging in research. And I was surprised not because it's happening in Pakistan, where people don't necessarily associate it with the country with development in research. I was surprised because this level of engagement you have is much higher than the ones I have seen in Birmingham and London. So I congratulate you and the organizers of this forum. Uh, it is correct that some things become a tick box and without it, without ticking those boxes, it's not possible to move forward in your profession. But that does not mean that uh, we should engage in research only in order to tick the box. We should engage in research because we want to make a difference. This is, this is the way I would suggest we should look at it. Absolutely agreed. Um, and I also think there's this strong belief that when you do research, it has to turn into a paper. Um, sometimes people invest a lot of time in research and they do not get any significant results out of it. Um, but it's still a worthwhile investment. I think that's another belief that needs to be challenged a little bit. But I understand that unless it's on your CV, you can't really show the work that you've done. So that, that's another... Well, let, me, let me just make a comment about that, uh, Mahin. Studies that have negative findings are also publishable. So just because your result is not positive actually does not mean that you should not publish. I take it even one step further. If you are doing research, with ethical permission and other regulatory approvals, I believe you have an ethical obligation to publish regardless of what your result is. Because if your negative finding is an important negative finding, you prevent other people from doing the same study, which will turn out to be negative in other places. So do not equate the positivity of your finding with the ability to get published. The ability to get published should be and is frequently linked to the strengths of the methods of the study. It's not linked to the positivity of the findings. I, 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 ho I hope that gives you encouragement to encourage others to publish their papers even when their findings are not positive. Yes, that's, that's very useful feedback. Sometimes the research isn't going in a certain direction and you've still invested time and learned a lot, but you can't put it into a manuscript form. What, what suggestions would you have um, if someone's experiencing that situation? Well, my advice is start publishing your protocols. You don't have to wait for the results to start publishing. There are many journals that publish protocols of studies and these are indexed. So as soon as your ethical approval is obtained, immediately start thinking about submitting the manuscript to a journal because you could not get ethical approval without writing your protocol. That protocol can now be refined and populated with references and submitted to a journal for publication. I believe there is even a place for you to ask the dean that AKU should invest in preparing its own journal. New England Journal of Medicine is 
a journal of a place in New England. And New England is a smaller city than the city of Karachi. AKU has more students, Pakistan, Karachi has more medical schools than New England has. The prospect of producing work that should be publishable through a recognized quality journal, possibly set in Karachi at AKU. Uh, I mean, why should it be a foreign idea? This should be the natural next step in development. It's another comment, Mahin, you say, without significant result to back the protocol, would a journal even consider it worthy of publishing? Uh, protocol is about what you are going to do. Therefore, there is no significant result. Well, there is no result, whether significant or not available, at the time of submitting your protocol for publication. So just to give you an example, I am advising as member of the COVID committee in Pakistan, a group in Lahore, who are running a randomized control trial. The results are not yet available, but their protocol is already published. It's cited in PubMed. If you search for protect study, you will find its protocol. They already have a paper published from the work they have done. Their study is not yet complete. The results are not known. Make sense? Um, hi, sir. So, we wish we could hear more of what the people want to say, but since we're nearing seven and the meeting would run out, if it's okay with you, we could start wrapping up now. Well, I'm, I'm entirely at your disposal. I'm happy to finish if that's what you think is a good idea. Okay. Thank you so much for taking out your time for this amazing lighting session. It was such a novel experience. And uh, I personally, I'd say I really learned a lot from this. And I'm sure everyone else would, uh, would think likewise as well. So thank you so much for taking out time for this. And thank you for making it open for all medical students across Pakistan. It, it, would, it was a really nice learning opportunity. And we're so glad that you want to um, invest your time in um, for the helping out people from Pakistan across Pakistan. So we're really grateful for that. And it was a wonderful session. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. No worries. It was a pleasure having you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you.